Hey Practice Biopsy, D'Angelo here with another great interview. Today you're going to meet my friend Husnain and he has an awesome story that's crazy. So Husnain is from the class of 2019. It's currently 2020. Okay. When he was a dental student, he came to one of my like dental student free seminars where I kind of chatted up, you know, this is what I did when I was a student. This is what I do now. And at the end of it, I said, you know, what's your next step going to be? And uh, I think that's the name. At that time, you were kind of thinking about maybe going into ownership. But okay. uh, maybe that talk kind of pushed you on. Anyways, here, here we are. He was class of 2019. Now it's 2020. He owns two practices. Go for it, man. Give, give yourself a little introduction. Yeah. So uh, I went to school in Baylor College of Dentistry. Now it's known as A&M in uh, Dallas, Texas. My last year of dental school, my D4 year, I was pretty heavy on, hey, I want to own a practice or I want to do a startup or something. I was listening to a bunch of webinars, reading some books, and pretty strong on that. And uh, I remember we had a, a webinar in, I think it was like October of 2019 or November. And in that webinar, we were like, okay, what are your next steps? I remember you telling me, all right, go talk to different practice owners, go make some offers, go figure some stuff out. And since November, I think I probably talked to like between November and April like 10 to 15 different dentists sat down with them, had lunch. And at least three of these, I thought we we're going to go through. Mm -hmm. They were real close to failing them. And then something would happen at the very end. Either the doctor would say, you know what, I'm not ready to retire or I'm not ready to sell or anything like that. So when it came to April, May, we took our, our rev exam for uh, dental school, got my license. One dentist, when I thought he was going to retire, he ended up saying, no, I'm good. So then I was stuck. I was like, okay, well, I got to get a job and I'm going to have my license in a month. And, I guess this practice ownership wasn't for me. I guess right now it wasn't. So I applied for a bunch of different jobs in my area. And I'm, I'm about two hours away from Dallas. So it's not the market isn't filled with dental positions or anything. So I joined this uh, corporate place for about six months. Those so big into extractions and implants and stuff. And I was doing that like three days a week. I did this other uh, healthcare type clinic. Um, they paid me real well. It was like two days a week. It was one of those gigs that one of my my reps told me about, and I'd make sure I reached out to every rep first too. And that's a good tip too. For people looking for jobs and practices, the local reps in the area, like the Shine reps and Patterson reps, we got a lot of information. So this guy told me about this opportunity, about uh, a job, and I was okay, let me look into it. And I'd go to this job for like two days a week, and they'd pay for my hotel stay, and uh, they, they need a dentist for like three months. Mm -hmm. And my gig over there was great. They paid me $1,600 a day just for like showing up. Is that like, uh, a, like a public health type of job? Yeah. 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 Public health type of job. It was kind of like I could see as many patients as I want or as very little as I want. And I was, that thing I think got me pretty confident because I was the only doctor there. Mm -hmm. And this is coming straight out of dental school. And our, our school, Baylor, it prepares you pretty well um, for dentistry and stuff. But still being the only like doctor there, you're kind of like, okay, what do I do now? I had to kind of figure that out as I went. And I worked like half a day in my own town. So I was driving like an hour and a half, like every day somewhere. A huge commute. And, and I was still, yeah. yeah. So I was still trying at that point. I was still trying to reach out to doctors and stuff and seeing, you know, is anyone going to retire soon? And I physically go to offices, physically talk to people, and just kind of see like, what's the the range. And in uh, January of this tw in 2020, I moved to my hometown permanently because the other doctor I was working with was getting real sick. And I was like, okay, you know, this is the practice I'm going to buy. This guy is like 74. He's getting real sick. He's going to die soon or retire or something. This is my place. And it was a, it was a huge practice. It was like a $2.4 million practice between this doc, me, and there's an associate. I think we talked about that. We talked about that one. I think you, yeah. I remember yeah. I was like out of yeah. town. I remember and you called me and you, we have to talk about this practice. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was like, man, this practice is great. It's huge. It's like everybody knows about it. Like this is going to be mine. And except the practice I, I didn't know at that time was a huge overhead. Overhead is like 70, 80%. It was Medicaid and every insurance in the book. And it was a lot of staff turnover. It was a lot of bad things. But I was like, you know what? At least there's a lot of patients. But when I started talking to a doctor and I'm like, April, May ish time. He wanted, um, he wanted like a for that two point four million dollar practice. He wanted like two million, and I was like, Doc, I can't give you two million for this practice. And it was one of those Doc never wanted to retire because he changed his mind of do I want to sell it, do I not? And I was like, you know, I can't even afford something like that. It doesn't even make sense. I ran all the numbers and all that. So I was like, okay, I guess I'll, I'll keep working. And at that point, I was like, you know what? 
forget it. I'm just going to go with the startup route. It's been a good year. Nothing's working out like in my area. My dad has some land. I'm just going to make a startup and look into that route. And then it hit summer or a summer time to June. Uh, June, uh, July, and I had a brother who uh, he just graduated dental school from Houston. And our goal is, you know, do something together as family. So we're like, you know, do we make a practice startup together? I'll do an associateship somewhere, you do one, and then we'll make our startup or whatever. And I got this, uh, so this DSO. I kept in contact with some like corporate places around here. And this DSO, they've got like 30 practices. They're all like smaller practices. They reach out to me and they say, you know, Doc, we have. I think it was this COVID time. They're like, hey, we're about to pick up three practices. One's in your area. It's like 10 minutes away from you. Do you want to work there for us? And I was like, me, work there for you? Like, I'm like, okay, I'm not that type of person at all. But I'm like, I'm listening to them, the conversation. Because I was like, to keep the door open and see what these guys are doing. And they're like, yeah, we got this one practice that the guy, the older guy, he's retiring. He's just watching a bunch of stuff. And we'll get you in there. Maybe after five, 10 years, you can uh, be a part owner. And I figured out the practice they were talking about. And I went straight and to the doctor. It. Like literally the next <laughs> Yeah. So I, I passed the practice the practice I bought. I went there and the next week I talked to the doctor. I was like, Hey, so here you're selling your practice and stuff. And he's like, Yeah, I'm uh, I'm tired of this COVID stuff and I'm t- I'm trying to retire. So his practice was like it was a smaller practice. He's doing like four hundred and fifty thousand a year. And he wanted to sell his practice and the building and everything. And I asked him, like, you know, what, what would you want for? And at that time, you know, that practice, when I valued it, it would probably be worth like 370, 360 type of thing. His building is worth like 200,000. So total, this thing's probably like 570 or something. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, Doug, what? I was trying to make some deals with him and everything. And I, I ran the numbers and stuff. I'm like, you know, if I just get this practice, like, I think the doctor's taking home like 200K. He was at like 50% overhead, smaller town. And we, after a bunch of talking, negotiating, all that stuff, I came down to 250000 as my the offer for the practice and the whole building, both total. So it was like he was just so like throwing 120, in the building. That's like equal 125 for the practice, 125 for the building for a yeah, place that's doing 450 revenue. Yeah, and the building is like the building is a 3,000 square foot building. It's got the dental practice, which is like 2,400 square feet and then there's like a 200 square feet little mini apartment there on the side and there's like this thousand square feet for storage place that we could rent mm-hmm. out or something later so basically so you got basically a 3,000 square foot building with two potential rental units and you paid mm-hmm. 125 for the building 125 for the practice and the practice is doing 450 so you got yeah. a, a practice so, doing 450 a 3,000 square foot building with multiple tenants for 250 yep <laughs> And the way, so I got, I got a loan from uh, Wells Fargo and the way we worked it out was they said, if you want to close real quick, we got to do some different strategic things. So the practice was like almost, it's like worth $10 as a gift or something. So I didn't have to pay like some taxes. I don't know what it was, some legal stuff and uh, the building. But the way that it worked out was hear this story. So I went up to him, like we agreed on the terms and stuff. And so this guy was very hesitant a little bit because he's like, you know what? I've had other doctors who made some offers and stuff and they, they analyze it for three months and they don't get approved for a loan or something and this doesn't happen. And I go to them the day I'm going to get the LOI. I got my LOI, letter of intent. It's like a little doctor, you know, if everyone doesn't know, just saying like, you know what, I'm serious about this and you can't sell this to anybody else. Because my worry was that corporate place is going to come back and just say, here, doctor, here's the money. I'm over here. I don't have that much money on hand or anything. Yeah, you but just graduated. I have a bunch of- yeah. At th- so at this point, it's been about a year now. So almost a lot of my money I made, I, I saved it. I really didn't store, I really didn't spend much besides CE courses and stuff because I was waiting for that opportunity. So, you know, when you want to buy a dental practice, most people say keep at least like 50000 stored in the bank or something or having some working capital or whatever if you need it. So I had some cash reserves if I ever needed that. And the day of, I went to him, had a three-page LOI document, and I said, Doc, I'm, I'm serious about this thing. We agreed on terms and everything. Let's sign this LOI. And he looks at the three page thing and he's like, uh, let me show my wife. Or let me talk to my lawyer about this before we get going. Now I took out a check from my pocket. I was like, Doc, I'm going to write this $5,000 check right now. Let's just close this deal. I'm serious about this. I'm a local hometown guy. You don't need to talk to anybody else. And he looks at the check for a second. He's like, you know what? Let's That's do it. That's the smoothest. I'm going to go talk to that. my wife response ever. <laughs> he signed it. read <laughs> it. I gave him the pen, we sign on it, and then from there, it's like smooth sailing. So that's, that's, that's the first That's the first oh, I don't want to say smooth sailing. 
that's the first. There's not a smooth song. There's a bunch of stuff that went on. But first off, this was good. Then, um, so I, at that point, I was like, okay, you know what? Maybe between me and my brother, I could work that two days a week or something have, and continue my associate job. And maybe my brother could come in. And they're having all this weird COVID stuff with their dental school and all that. So it's like their licenses have been delayed and all this type of stuff. So we're trying to figure out what's best. I was like, okay, you know, I'll do that two days a week. I'll do my associate job two days a week. And maybe we'll be thinking about that startup plan on the side. And um, I, I told him, I was like, hey, brother, make sure you're applying for all these jobs all around our area. And because you, know, you have to be an associate and make some money. And he applies to this uh, this dentist in our town. He like he comes here from Dallas and he works two days a week and every other Friday. And he applies as an associate position over there. And the doc gives him the worst offer you could give to a dentist. He pretty much says, "All right, you're gonna work for me for you know whatever long a time, but the, for the first two months you're only gonna do pro fees and SRPs. That's all you're gonna do. You're not gonna touch my patients until like month three, and I'm gonna let you pick up a hand piece if I, if I trust you. And I'll, and then he says he's gonna give him like thirty bucks an hour. My brother tells me this, and I'm like, dude, go like, give him a piece of your mind or something. But I'm like, you know what? Just leave it alone. My parents always told me never always keep the door open. And like three weeks later, when my brother's applying to this guy, like I think it's like that when I bought after like a week of, after I bought the first practice, we bought that one. I get a call from the wife of the the dentist, and she says my husband had a heart attack. And he was in the hospital and they figured out he had stage four liver cancer or something. And before he was about to pass away, he said, hey, call the Dr. Shahid's up, the brothers. Their information is on my desk. They wanted to buy my practice or work it. Call them and sell them my practice. And then he starts saying that. And literally after that, like, I think he said something about I'm seeing my mom now. And like, he passed away. This is in the hospital bed when he had his situation. So I get a call from the wife saying like, hey, um, this is so-and-so. My husband passed away. And he said, you guys were interested in buying the practice and everything. And this is like legitly a week after the first one. And I'm like, okay, we got one. I'm an associate. Maybe we could do the second one. Like, it's an opportunity. Like, I never want to turn away these opportunities. I think my life these days is kind of like, what is it? Luck equals preparation plus opportunities or whatever that thing is. You got to be ready when the so lucky like, situation okay. comes along. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm like, okay, you know what's the worst that could happen? Let's see what she wants wants for it. And so I get all the numbers and everything, and this practice is doing like, I think this one's also doing like 450 yep. a year. So about the same, about 450 one, revenue, similar to the other one. Except this is on the, this is in my hometown. So this is a town I've been raised in 20 years. This this town's population is like 30,000 with the surrounding areas. There's um there's no special. There's a pediatric dentist here and an orthodontist here. No other specialists. They have a lot of small satellite office where an oral surgeon and an endodontist come like once a week. Um, but pretty much that that's it. It's like eight general dentists and they're, a lot of them are kind of older. There's only like one corporate place. So I was like, you know, this is my town. This is where I wanted to do my startup. I was like, you know, this would be a great, if I got to buy this one, brother, it'd be a great entryway and we could eventually do a startup or something down the road or move these people. So they're now 450 or whatever on two days and every other Friday type of thing. But this practice is also known as like, is the more expensive. This guy was doing a lot of cosmetic dentistry. And the wife, she had a bad reputation in the town. Like she would, I don't know if she would she, cheat a lot of people. Or like she would, she, we, we figured out later when we started getting in here, all the crappy stuff she would do. But people hated her for like a mile, an hour distance. So I started talking to her about what she wanted. And I was with a lawyer talking about all these things. And he pretty much said, you know, the minute the doc passes away, the practice, uh, what is their asking point goes in half. So I think the, the practice is worth like 380 or something, like based on their collection and stuff. Um, then he says, you know what, it's worth like 200K now or something like that. So I made an offer of 200K and I told the wife and she agreed to it. She said, okay, you know what, Let, let's do it. But the situation was so weird that the wife, she was using a, a broker person to sell the practice. Yeah. And after like a week, like I was talking to this broker lady about the practice and stuff, maybe not even a week, probably three days later, I contact the broker and say, hey, where are we at in the process of stuff? And she's like, well, I'm no longer working with the wife now. And I'm like, what do you mean you're no longer working with her? And she says she, she fired me because she didn't want to pay me. And I'm like, really? I was like, you know what? And the ladies tell me how she works for dentists mm -hmm. too, as their brokers as well, like a buyer's broker. And I'm like, hey, would you want to come on my side and help me with this stuff? Because you know all the number right. information about this practice. And she's like, yeah, sure. So I ended up getting like, she keep knew the all doors this open on those opportunities, right? Yeah, right. So I bring her on my side. She knew everything. She's like, yeah, this practice, I would only give them like 200K. They got all this stuff going on, this and that. And I, but we didn't tell the other people I'm, I'm using her. And uh, so 
We're getting this deal going along. Got the lawyer doing all the contracts and everything. Except this lady at one point, the lawyer said, hey, you want to get in that practice as soon as you can. Start working as an associate. Because the longer you go not working there, patients are going to go away. And this is a year where like two months it was shut for COVID. The doctor worked for a month and a half and he passed away. So now it's going at like a three weeks, no doctors there. So I'm okay, I got to get in there ASAP. Um, so we start talking and ladies like, no, I want my money before you come in this practice at all. And I'm like, lady, like, I, it's going to take some time for this loan and stuff. And I was telling the banker, too, that I was using for the, the first practice. I'm like, hey, how quickly can I get this money? And, you know, even if you got a loan, they have to go through the whole process. Yeah, go through the whole process, stuff. yeah. And she's, she's got to know that the longer this drags on, the, the further the price is going to get driven mm -hmm. down. So that, that was a problem. She was like, I just want my money. And I'm like, okay, like, lady, it's going to take works. some time. Um, yeah, and I was like, we can make a contract of something or whatever. We came down to, I was like, you know what? Let me think as smart as I can what I can do. Because I don't want this opportunity to go away. And I tell her, because she told me at one point, she's like, I got a $60,000 loan or something on the practice or whatever it was. And I said, I was like, okay, lady, like, how about this? How about I give you 60000 in cash, and then the rest of it we finance through the bank. And um, we'll, we'll finance, I'll, I'll give you, we'll put a note on it for like three months, and I'll have you the money. Because by that time, I should have a loan or mm -hmm. something. And uh, we'll do that. And then she's like, okay, you know, we, we could do that. And I was like, you know, I saved a lot of money up when I was working and stuff. So I'm like, okay, I, that was a good thing I could do. So I, we talked to her about that. And we were just signing the last legal paperwork document stuff. And she, we were supposed to sign like on a, and this legal paperwork stuff with her took a while. Every little line, her and her lawyer were analyzing, like, take this thing out, take that thing out. I didn't really know much about this. It was just kind of my lawyer just doing that stuff with her. And he was just kind of telling me, here's what she says, here's what I recommend and all that. And the week before, or like, yeah, the week we're going to sign on a Friday, he sends me the document. He's like, hey, doc, they changed one line on that document. It's very important. And I was like, what did they change? And she said that there's a line that says the equipment is in good working condition. And he's like, they, they took that line out completely. And I was like, okay, what does that mean? And he's like, well, if they take that out, either the lady stole all the equipment or it's broken and you're just going to get it as is. I would get somebody to go inspect it or lowball your offer. And this is offer at 200K. Now it's been about a month and a half since this deal's going on. Her, the two, the three staff people they had, they all left when the doctor passed away. So there's no more like goodwill left or anything. So I'm like, okay, let's go bring out a rep to go look at the stuff. I have this uh, shine rep go and take a look at the practice. And he only spends like five minutes in his whole practice. And he's like, well, there's a couple of those digital sensors and chairs look nice. Like, and he like roughly does a quick estimate. And he's like, it's worth between 50,000 and 70,000 of equipment if you sell it in the secondary market. And I talked to my lawyers and I'm like, you know what? So what is that? What do we make an offer of now? He's like, well, doc, it's up to you. I probably wouldn't value it at 200K, but if you think you can make at least two to 300K next year, anything 200K or under is up to you. The loan difference per month is very small and all that. To me, it seems like a lot of money, like between offering 100K, 200K, that's a lot of money. But to a lawyer, it, I guess it didn't yeah. seem like it was much, but he's like, you know, you can offer whatever It changes you want. your monthly payment by like a thousand bucks or less. Yeah, so I'm like, okay, that's not, that's not much, but I want to make sure I get a good deal. I'm, I'm Pakistani, so we're all about good deals and stuff. So I, uh, I calculated it out, and I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm just going to – they say it's worth like 60, 50, 60 worth of equipment. And, you know, they don't practice. You're only buying the goodwill and equipment. Not, this one I'm not buying the building in because it was leased by another dentist or something. So we got to pay rent for it. So I was like, you know, let's just drop it down. And I came out with like my brother. We talked about it, and we said, you know, let's offer them – Eighty-three thousand five hundred dollars. So you do wait. You dropped it from two hundred to eighty-three k. Eighty-three k. Well, she five hundred. And you know, if she had just closed the deal earlier, she would have got the two hundred. She would have. She, she would have. Yeah. Go so ahead. Keep... For my head, it was like you know what. Worst scenario, she says no. I got another practice I'm doing, and we're gonna be doing this startup. Like that. That's that was the goal. This is just like icing on the cake. I really wanted to get this practice because it's in my hometown. And then my other thinking was, I guess you have to look at where you're at. There's no one here. I'm not in the Metroplex with super popular or something. No one's going to come here unless you're from here or something. So I'm like, you know what? They can try all they want to sell this. No other dentist, even a dentist who owns like multiple practices, who's got money. They're not going to come here for this like low opportunity. They're looking for like 800,000 practices or whatever. So I'm like, you know what? I'm her best shot. So you better understand that situation. And we went through like two different brokers. Like she was talking to two different lawyer people or people about it. And like we went through a lot. So I, I had in my mind, like, she's probably going to say no. It's all good. So she says back to my lawyer, like, we did through a lawyer, tech email. And she's like, 
no, thank you. I'm going to sell my equipment and I'm going to make more money for it. Thank you guys for your business. And I was so like sad at that moment that day. I was like, man, I just, I'm probably going to spend like three, four K on lawyer fees. And I made this whole entity up and all that, all this time. Oh, well, I guess it wasn't meant to be. And then uh, the lawyer's like, don't worry. She'll, she'll be back. And probably like two to three weeks later, I get a text message from her saying, hey, doc, I'll take you up on your last offer. And I'm like, no, you won't. <laughs> like, you won't take me up Why? Because it just went even lower? Because <laughs> it went even lower. Like, and I'm like, okay, like, I'm trying to think about this. I'm like, okay, what do I, how much lower can you go? And I'm like, you know what, let me, let me tell you this. So I, I talked to her on the phone, and this is like without the lawyer's like consent, whatever. But I'm talking to her on the phone. I'm like, you know what, ma'am? I just bought another practice, and I don't have any more money. The money I was going to give you as like a down payment, like it's gone. And keep in mind, I do have money at this point. I still got a good amount of money. But I didn't, want to, uh, I didn't want to tell her that. But I tell her this. I was like, you know what? Maybe I could do this. I could probably ask my dad or get a loan from my dad or something if he's got money and stuff. And I could probably offer you like 40000 in cash. And like, I never know, 80, 200 to 83 to 40. And I knew she was going to say no. But I'm like, you know what? Let's, what's the worst that could happen? And she's like, oh, no, 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 no. That's not going to work. Like, I can sell the equipment way more. Like, I need... I need um. So this is when it got me. She says I need at least sixty. No, she says I need sixty-five thousand at least sixty-five thousand. In my head, it was like okay. No, I don't think. I know. I think she said I need your last offer. Like I need eighty-three thousand or something like that. And I was like, I can't. I can only do forty. I think my dad only has that much. Uh, I can probably borrow from him and stuff. And then she was about to hang up the phone and she's like, you know what? I could probably sell my equipment and at least make 70, 80. And I was like, okay, ma'am, how about this? How about we meet in the middle? Let's do, what if we do like 60? And then I like, we went in half. Because at that, that point, more moment, she was about to hang up the phone and I was like, you know what? The difference between 40 and like 85, even if I said yes, I was prepared to say yes to 85. I was like, let me just low ball as much as I can go, see where I can get. I'm going to say yes regardless. But um, I said, let's do 60 before she was going to hang up the phone. Because I was like, you know, I'm not going to nickel and dime these small things. And she says, um, this is when she, she says something smart. She's like, you know, the lowest I can go is 60. No, she says, I need at least 60 to 65,000, at least that much to pay off my stuff. And the minute she told me that, I'm like, well, I just got it even lowered. Like I could give her like 60 potentially. Like, uh, so I, I can probably do that. And then I told her, I was like, you know what? Let me talk to my dad to see if I can even get a loan from him or whatever. And I hung up the phone, talked to my dad about stuff. And I was like, you know, dad, I'm, I'm probably going to give her that 60,000 or 65. Is that cool with you? We had the money and stuff. And he's like, yeah, uh, if you can lowball her, keep going and see what you can get from her. And I was like, okay, sure. So I call her back and I'm like, so lady, my, my dad said he'd give me 40, but that's all the money we have. So I could probably give you 10,000 as a, a note, but I could give it to you later. And she's like, no, no, no. I need, I think this is the point we, we agreed to 65. She said, in the conversation before, she said, if you gave me 65,000 and close it like this weekend, then we'll do it. And then I you know, contact my dad, talk to him, and then talk to this lady back again. And I said, you know, I could give you 40 in cash, and then I could give you 10,000 later, on um, like a couple months later on a note. And she's like, no, I need at least 60. So she was at 65 yeah, so with me. Then she dropped down to 60. And I'm like, okay, I got like five K. I get 60 is her number. I'm like, you know what? I'm probably not going to get lowered from that. So I was like, okay, lady, how about this? I'll give you 40 this weekend. And the next like month or two, I'll give you the other 20. How about that? We'll sign off on it. I'll give it to you this weekend. And she's like, you know what? Okay, let's do it. So this practice closed at 60,000, 40,000 in hand, cash on hand, on a check, and 20,000 after like a month. So this is number two. So you didn't even need any financing for practice number two from the banks. No financing for practice That's great, man. <laughs> so this one we're not we didn't buy the building it was, we're, we're renting off yeah. the building it's like in front of a hospital it's a busy area for the hospital it's right by the hospital maybe eventually we'll buy. yeah it's like, yeah, it's like literally, literally right in front of the hospital a lot of cars pass here there's like a pediatric dentist down the street and it's a great yeah, it's gonna be great location. and like you said like the other there's no specialists around really other than peds and ortho mm -hmm. um the other dentist was only working like two days a week you're gonna be able to and right by the yeah. hospital you're gonna be able to make this place huge yeah, so those are those two things. So that that's been the the thing getting those going. So we, we waited like a good two three weeks before we opened on this one because it was the hiring of people and trying to manage. Yeah, because all the staff from that second office is probably gone, right? They're, they're all gone. There's no one there. We tried contacting them and all that, and nobody responded. And the first office practiced the staff within like two weeks. One by one, they all left. 
And there, there were did you, there did you, like, I just reposted an interview with uh, Dr. Saurabh Ansari yeah. about, like, he bought the practice and then all the yeah. staff was gone. And your second practice, all the staff was gone because there's so much time in between. And the first one, all gone? With the, I mean, so one was a doctor. It wasn't a huge yeah. practice, like, staff. But one was a doctor, so he retired. One was his wife, who was playing, like, his assistant slash yeah. hygienist. And she would stick around for hygiene. She did for a couple of weeks. And the doctor's like, hey, I need my wife back. Like, we're trying to go yeah, on vacation. Back. I don't want her to work. <laughs> okay, sir, okay, take her with you. There's another hygienist there that she was working part-time in our practice and part-time in another doctor's practice. Mm -hmm. And she said, she's like, Doc, they offered me a full-time job over there. And I've been working there 30 years. Nothing against y'all, but I have to go. I'm like, okay, no problem. Then there's only the front office girl. And then she, the doctor warned me about her. He said, this lady is very hesitant to change. He put like a little clear window in front of her that for like COVID protection. And it took her two weeks to get used to having something up there. So we, we kind of knew she was going to go. So they all kind of left. So we brought in our own like assistant and a receptionist. We had to bring a hygienist in day one, day one. Cause this was like October, November time. Whereas like hygiene was like from that March time, it wasn't much. So we were doing our own hygiene and stuff. Now it's picking up. So we hired a hygienist who's starting this Monday up there. Um, so that was that that i think my biggest struggle in the beginning was this hiring firing people because i know dentistry like i'm i'm glad i had a year of learn, like practice in dentistry yeah. my brother he's fresh out of school so when you part of me when i was trying to buy a practice when i was out of school like i'm looking back now i'm kind of glad i didn't do it right really like that one year gave me enough time to do dentistry yeah. and, like, and you almost not going can't through. do it right right out of school because the whole process that yeah. you just described and even with myself the whole process takes like a good year to really get through it the right way just all the mm -hmm. searching all the negotiating it takes time so you're working yeah. during that time yeah no, it's, it's better now in my mind because i'm like i go into some procedures like the bread and butter dentistry stuff and i'm like you know i don't have to worry about this as much as like my brother so i'm also going to something and say oh yeah how do you how do we do this part again or hey can you walk me through this thing and that and i'm like you know what as long as i'm doing the business stuff handling stuff a lot of that yeah. the focus isn't super on dentistry but i'm like you know i want to hurry up and get this business stuff in like a row so i can start focusing more on the, the clinical side of stuff again but um that's that's where we are there on those, those two things we're hiring people and the other hard thing for me was training people on stuff that i don't know how to do myself like when it came to insurance like so we got out of school and everything and we're not credentialed with anybody one of the offices was fee for service and the other one was like in network with a bunch of people for getting on the credentialing thing um hiring people and then telling them okay you got to look up insurance and this and that stuff and i'm like well i don't i don't know how to do that myself like how am i going to tell you what to do a situation yeah so trying to figure that stuff out we hired some good people we're still like going between a couple people in like the front office over there yeah. but um we got our people in place and stuff we're having our official ribbon cutting for this sixty thousand dollar office um this next friday i was talking to you about that mm -hmm. so bringing the town and all those people um so doing that between the both of those and just kind of slowly getting going on that stuff so that's kind of where we're at right now nice, man so i know that you are a, a graduate of the practice biopsy ownership ce course can you talk a little bit about how the ce course helped you through this process yeah so initially like, I, was, I was one of those dental students that i would i was doing everything like uh this podcast that book and this book i think sometimes that's my problem i'll listen to too many people and i mean it's good too like, you get different advices and stuff but your course was great in the sense that all the the things you don't think about it's all there the whole okay like people say save on your supplies or save on your this and that and you got li li listed out of here's a sheet you need to make your system look at like print this out, just change your name up here or yeah and i was like you know what? i need that like the podcast or other people are saying just hey save on supplies or do this thing and that thing here's the a to z on exactly how you do it so i, I appreciate all that there's still stuff i haven't i finished the majority of the course and everything and i still go back and i'm like okay wait what do you say about that one thing and let me go through that module again print this thing out so it's super beneficial on a lot of that stuff so i appreciate it well, thanks man. So go back and I, I thanks i could play a role in helping you along all the success that you're about to have <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, another question mm -hmm. I have for you is like the mindset. So like most dental students are not thinking about any of this at all. And like you're basically mm -hmm. class of 2019 is 2020. You're essentially a year out of school, own two practices. Um, what, how did you prepare mentally and how did you like 
separate yourself from like the students who weren't thinking about this at all? Like what was different with your mentality while you were in school? So one thing I'll tell you, it's not a brag or anything, but just to tell you, so I'm a, I'm 25 years old right now. So I was the, the baby of dental school. I was one of those people we'd had an associate, uh, what is called dual credit classes and stuff when I was in high school. So when I finished high school at 18, I had my associate's degree technically. Then I went to college for two years, did my bachelor's, then got into dental school first time. So I finished dental school at 23 and I had just turned like 24. Mm -hmm. And my goal initially was all right, like first year, I was thinking about doing some specializing. I was thinking about specializing. I was like, you know what? Maybe I'll go into oral surgery. That's what I was thinking about a little bit. I was like, you know, I'll be, I'll be, I'll graduate 24. I'll be 30 by the time I start working, maybe 31, and start making money around 32 ish. Man, after first year, I kept thinking a lot about it. I'm like, you know what? I read some cousins and relatives who are like 32, 33. Do I really want to start my life at like 32, 33? And I'm pretty businessy. Like my, my parents own a gas station business, and I've been working there throughout the summers and breaks and stuff. And I, I like after first year, I was like, you know what? I'm more meant for businessy stuff, um, making my own hours and managing and this and that type of stuff. So I, after my first year dental school, I kind of figured that out. So I was like, you know what? I want to do business dentistry type of stuff like i want to be my own boss that's what kind of came in the dental field like it's fun you get to be your own person and all that so after about first year i was super head into like i want to own a practice so it was watching podcasts and just preparing myself for that stuff caring about school but not as much so it was like between second third and fourth year it was going through every like clinical thing i could mission trips and extra those things in school making the most of my clinical time and then outside was reading a lot of books and the podcast and all that to prepare myself okay like when i graduate what do i have to do step by step by step and then listen to kind of different people and stuff and your your whole thing got me when you always talk about i'm just doing dental school stuff the procedures i do everything i learned in dental school and i'm like d'angelo it's not possible like, you gotta be able to place one plan you gotta be able to sleep out me and overthrow and all this like you can't open a practice unless you know how to do all that because I was in Dallas at the time of dental school and uh, all the people around me, like, you know, uh, the dentist and stuff, I would shadow and stuff. They were doing all this implants and all these advanced or things that we don't learn in dental school. And I'm like, you know, I probably have to at least work a while to go learn all that stuff. Well, listening to you and you're like, you know, if you can take an impression, you can do a denture. If you can cut a tooth, you can do a crown. And I'm like, you know, he's, he's so right. Like, at the end of the day, like it's worst scenario with what goes on, like your margin's a little off or something, or like, you know, it's it's all possible. And so after that mind says, okay, you know, let me prepare myself clinically as good as I can in school. And then, you know, that mentality of what's the worst that could happen. And I think someone told me one time when I was looking at these both dental practices, I think, I don't, I think it was you or someone else wanted to tell me, they're like, you know what, worst scenario, doc, they both fail whatever happens and you still become a dentist as a job and make six figures a year. So. I guess. Yeah. Except there's that mentality of like, hey, I want this. How do I get there? But I think it's, I think for me, biggest thing is mindset, knowing that you want to get something and how to do it comes afterwards. But you got to prepare yourself, not get overwhelmed by all that stuff out there. All right. So I like to keep these interviews around 30 minutes. So we're just around that. We're going to wrap it up. I got one more question for you, which is the same question I asked you last time. What's your next move? The next move in this is to grow both of these practices real well. Um, I, I learned a lot this first year clinically. I took a bunch of PE courses. So I want to add, I actually learned implants and stuff, sleep apnea, I want to get to Invisalign. And I want to kind of be the practice that everyone, the specialty practice around here. I'm the only doctor that does implants in like a hour radius. Now I just have to kind of hone it in, advertise it specifically and all that. So I want to be like, kind of like you, the go-to doc, but uh, do that. And then for bigger procedures and everything, try to keep everything in house if I can. That's the goal for both of these. And then who knows later on if I'll make my own thing or not, or buy this place out or something. <laughs> well, I appreciate you coming on and sharing your time. Um, again, I'm really proud of you and I wish you a lot of, a lot of luck. And I know this interview is going to help a lot of dentists, dental students uh, that are watching this. And I really appreciate it. Okay. Yeah, and if anyone needs any advice or anything, feel free to ask around or ask him for reach Yeah, he's great. Post in the comments below. Send him a question. Send me a question. All right. Thanks, man. Take it easy, okay? Have a good weekend. Thanks. Thanks.